Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Welcome to a brief moment to reflect and, and quiet our hearts in the middle of the week. I do apologize that a little more of the week has gone by than usual and there's a little less left, but uh, Wednesday, things happened, but God's still offering us the chance to reflect today. Um, for those of you in Swepsonville, I would imagine the church council will probably meet in the coming weeks. Probably not Labor Day, but the one after, but I need to check with that. But just start thinking on that. Um, but other than that, uh, we're entering into the fall season, a busy time of charge conference and organization and preparation for the year. And, and it's always good to remember these times of quiet. Uh, like I said, I'm trying to keep these a little shorter, so we'll, we'll uh, go into a time of devotion now. I hope you'll pray with me. Almighty God, as you have sent Jesus to be for us light and truth, send now your Spirit upon us to grant us grace and strength to follow in his footsteps this day. Amen. So I bit off a little more than I can chew when it came to the Mark passage I assigned myself. So I may pick up chapter 12 next week. But what we're going to look at in chapter 11 is Jesus cursing the fig tree. And so this is a pretty interesting little section. It's chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, and then 20 through 25. And the reason it's split up is because in between these two passages... Jesus goes in and cleanses the temple. And right before this passage is uh, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. So, so Jesus has entered into Jerusalem, and this is the first thing he does in the story. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So then Jesus goes into Jerusalem, cleanses the temple. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. What a strange thing. Mark does this sometimes. He'll take two pieces of a story and put another story in the middle. And so a lot of clever people have, have considered that maybe this fig tree, Jesus curses it and then comes back and finds it withered, maybe it's a symbol for the temple. Right? Maybe it's a symbol for what he has just done. Maybe they're connected. It may also be that Mark needs some time to pass. He needs the fig tree to have time to wither. And so he puts another story he has in the middle. I can't really say. But I do think I see why they did not uh, put this in the lectionary. We're still dealing with texts that we wouldn't read on Sunday. Although this Sunday we might read some of one I've read to you in the past few weeks. And it's, it's, it's such a strange story. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He comes across a fig tree in leaf, but it's not the season for figs. It would be like me coming up to an apple tree in July. Or a stalk of corn, uh, if it was still there, in, in October. Or my tomato plants now. 
they've given out. Some of yours probably haven't. And Jesus finds this tree at a time when it shouldn't have fruit on it, finds it without fruit, and says, all right, you're cursed, fig tree. And they come back, and it's withered. And maybe, <clears throat> maybe this story is just here to say, look at how powerful Jesus was. Look at how much he could do. Look at how uh, quick to judge he could be. Kind of a scary thought. But if we listen to the moral Jesus offers us, he says it's a lesson about praying. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and do not doubt in your heart, but believe it'll happen for you. Jesus is saying, if you really want to curse a fig tree, it can get cursed. That's a hard teaching. Because we sometimes feel as if the things we pray do not get answered. And that would be a much longer thing to talk about what that might mean or whether our prayers are answered in a different way than we expect or, or whether uh, we don't believe enough. All of that might be true. But what I want to wonder today, because of that strange truth, is whether we pray for the things we really want. Would you be so bold as to be in a bad mood, come upon a tree and ask God to curse it. I would say, oh, maybe God doesn't need to deal with that. And speaking practically, I find myself praying all the time, praying around what I really want. Sometimes in church, we do pray for healing. But very often what I find myself praying for is uh, wisdom for medical professionals or peace for a sick person. Those are good prayers, useful prayers, powerful prayers. But sometimes what I'm really saying is, Lord, heal this person. And I think Jesus would point out that by avoiding that prayer, by praying for peace or comfort, I am uh, in some ways doubting God doubting that God has the ability to heal them. Maybe I've let that life experience, or what I felt was the life experience, dampen my belief that God could do anything. I don't think it can hurt to pray more boldly, to be as honest with God as we can. If we want a tree cursed, to curse it. If we want someone healed, pray for the healing. It may be that God does not always answer our prayers in the way we expect or the way we want, but it can't hurt to ask. And it may be that that's more for our own souls than for God's perception. God knows what we really want. God knows our hearts closer than we do. But sometimes it might help that we know our own hearts. That we express what we really feel. I point out very often that there are psalms that pray curses upon one's enemies. I don't think that means that, that God will always curse the people we want cursed. But it does mean that if you have some malice towards someone, you can give it up to God. An experience that maybe you have had that was uh, a real challenge for myself was when you are in a room trying to offer a prayer for someone who you know is dying. I've been in those rooms, not as many as perhaps some of you or as I, I expect to be. And sometimes you want to ask for a miracle. 
And maybe sometimes we should. We should say, Lord, if you can bring this person out of this, bring them out. But I've, and you probably have too, talked to people who were ready to go to glory. <laughs> who didn't, didn't, didn't want the miracle to continue this life, but to move on to the next. I don't think there is anything helped in, in trying to hide our feelings and just saying, God, your will be done. I think it's fine for prayers to be a mess, to pray, Lord, if you would bring this person out of it, bring it, and we would wish it, and, and, and Lord, we are so grieved, and yet to say, um, we want comfort, we want peace, we want ultimately, Lord, eternity. I wonder when we finally come to meet him, whether it is when we ourselves pass away or if he returns to earth before then, I wonder what Jesus will say about our prayers. <clears throat> Maybe he'll say, you could have been bolder. Maybe he'll say, why were you so focused on yourself? But maybe he'll say, I'm here to answer them. I heard them all. The thing about you or me is that we're not, in some ways we're like plants. We have life cycles and life spans, different periods of life. But when it comes to our life in Christ, we can always be flowering. We can always be fruitful. No matter where you are or what you're uh, experiencing, if someone comes to you looking for love, looking for fruit, looking for Jesus, we can offer it. It's worth asking today how Jesus will find you praying. What prayers you could lift up more honestly. I don't think we mean to be dishonest with God. But if you let a little bit of that doubt creep in, you, you can put up a veil. Well, I believe that God is calling us to pray boldly, and so I will try to pray as boldly as I can as we go through the rest of our week. God bless y'all. Almighty God, we pray in earnest confusion for the ways we do not always see our prayers answered. Lord, we ask truly for those we love who are sick to be healed. For those who are dying to, to receive what it is you would have for them. Whether it is continued life here, which we believe you can do, Lord, or your eternal glory. Lord, we pray for each of us, for our own comfort, our own safety, but also for that of others. Lord, help us to pray boldly, earnestly, and honestly to you. And Lord, speak in our hearts that we may pray with belief, with certainty. And Lord, whenever you come back, return to this world, we ask that you would find us in fruit, offering you to the world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace. And uh, until we meet again on Sunday, I hope you can pray boldly, earnestly. And with faith that God can do what you're praying. Go in peace.